So welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for choosing this, our innovation stream for our parallel sessions today. My name is Jennifer Baker. I am a policy journalist based here in Brussels, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Uh, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers, so while I have many questions, let's hope they all have the answers. Uh, we are going to start with a keynote address to really set the scene and get us all in the right frame of mind for our discussion, which is going to be called Setting the Biobase Sector's Research and Innovation Priorities for the Next 30 Years. So a, quite a, a tall order there. And we know the Council Regulation establishing the CBE joint undertaking sets out three main objectives for the joint undertaking. Accelerate the innovation process and development of bio-based innovative solutions by intensifying and accelerating research, testing and upscaling the use of novel technologies. Accelerate market deployment of existing mature and innovative bio-based solutions by promoting the scale-up as well as bio-based processes, products and applications and ensure a high level of environmental performance. So, lots to incorporate into our discussion. As you can see, we have a big panel. You will hear introductions from everyone setting out their take on the current ecosystem. And then, of course, we want to count on everyone's questions. So please feel free to put your hand up when we get to that Q&A point as well. And we're going to use Slido as well to take the temperature of the room and get some ideas that we can feed back into our discussion. With that, I will introduce you to our opening address that is from Kevin O'Connor, former chair of the BBI Joint Undertaking Scientific Committee and director of Biorbic. Kevin, take it away. Thanks very much and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, um, yeah, this works. So, um, as uh, to start, I suppose we look at the strategic research and innovation agenda. Um, obviously, a 30-year view is uh, very difficult uh, to project. Um, if you look at the strategic research and innovation agenda, it takes maybe a five-year to 10-year view of the world. Um, and as has already been uh, said, you know, the, the CBE, and I'll talk about CBE, but I'm also talking about the BBI when I'm talking about the CBE. Um, but it's set out really to try and fill the gaps, identify the gaps, bring industry and academia closer and also try to demonstrate and scale technologies. But there's a lot of science in between that technological development as well. And so it's about increasing our understanding, it is about increasing our cooperation, and it is about increasing our demonstration. So you can see from the slide here, we're talking about acceleration, market deployment, producing products, demonstrating to the market, but also having a high level of environmental awareness, environmental performance. And maybe that it sets us apart from many other parts of the world where bio-based seems to be enough, but in Europe we're trying to say it's bio-based, but it's also about its environmental impact. And so if you look at how we started out in, uh, since 2012, when we were looking at how do we replace a fossil economy with a bio-based economy, uh, we actually moved from a predominantly bio-based fuels focus on bioenergy towards more higher value products, such as polymers, chemicals, bioactives, they are seen in things like personal care, healthcare, paints, glues, um, cosmetics, fragrances, uh, flavors, um, fertilizers, many, many different products yeah, that we can make. So uh, the first part in trying to innovate is diversifying. But we also see that uh, the model was, okay, we want to replace this fossil-based economy, which is the barrel on the left, and the fossil-based economy is going to produce products like fuel, plastics, uh, fertilizers, which are, are uh, for our foods, uh, materials, etc. But it's producing carbon dioxide. It's also producing a lot of methane, uh, and it's producing a lot of waste. So it's the it's the make, use, and dispose model. And the original idea was to replace fossil with bio-based, but that's not circular. And the, it evolved towards let's think uh, about circularity. And many people think of circularity as being recycling. But circularity is not just recycling. Circularity is about looking at your resources and valuing those resources and keeping them at the highest value possible and minimizing the use of that resource where you're, you think you're going to generate waste. So it's very much about prevention, minimization, like the EPA recycling pyramid uh, before you start to recycle. 
And there are many different ways in which we, uh, many different resources that we can use, virgin resources that can produce, for example, food. We often forget about food in the bioeconomy. It is a critical pillar of the bioeconomy. And I've mentioned the other products that we make. But of course, we will generate side streams, whether that's food waste, whether that's carbon dioxide, whether that's methane uh, from animals, whether that's um, dung or manure, etc., from, from animals. What can we do with those resources? We can produce uh, products of value. So therefore, we're adding uh, to the value, keeping the value uh, in the material cycle, for example. And many of those products are actually returned to nature or can be used in nature, either as fertilizers, biostimulants, but also biodegradable or compostable uh, materials as well. And so really the CBE or the BBIJU has helped us to expand our biomass targets, to stop thinking linearly, to think more uh, holistically, uh, to also think about zero waste and zero waste biorefineries, and we need to do a lot more there. Uh, but also it's about quantifying the impact. It's not enough to say it's bio-based, it's also to say, well, what is the real impact? And not to think of the impact as just simply uh, about environmental, but also what is the economic and what are the social impacts. And Katia Bassioli talked about communities, and we must think about the rural communities where this biomass is coming from, and how do we have a fair and just transition. That is all part of the development of the bioeconomy, and CBEJU has been instrumental in uh, moving the dial on that. And so really, if you look at the CBEJU, what has it done? You can see it has brought us together today but it has brought many different actors together to create that critical mass and that critical thinking and orientating people who are actually in the bioeconomy and have been for decades but don't know and understand uh, the modern uh, bioeconomy and that they play a role. And of course, collaboration is really, really important. And ultimately, if you look at um, some of the early initiatives from uh, the uh, EU in the lead market initiatives, which was the forerunner to BBI and now CBE, it's about scaling, it's about demonstrating. But where do we need to go? In many ways, we need to do a lot of what we've already been doing and do more of it and do it better. But also we need to, again, further diversify. So you think about circularity and resource efficiency, and we think about carbon and carbon neutrality, but we also have other nutrients like nitrogen, like phosphorus. These are now critically important as well, or they have always been critically important, but they're becoming more into attention and soil health. Yeah, soil is the basis for which we will produce biomass and soil that is resilient, biomass that is resilient. And also then uh, reducing the amount of waste or if we're going to harvest a crop, how, how can we get the maximum out of it? And also the poor cousin of the bioeconomy, the blue bioeconomy, yeah, has massive innovation but it's often overlooked and it can help to relieve a lot of the stresses uh, that are occurring in land use uh, by using the marine. But the marine is both a resilient and a fragile environment. And we have to make sure that when we exploit it, we also protect it. So, and also the information technology that is going to play a critical role is about the use of data. It is about the collection of data. It is about the access to data and the ownership of data. These things are becoming critically important. And so there's a huge role for social sciences as much as there is for technical sciences uh, in this area. And of course, safe and sustainable by design is really critically important. And bio-based has a really fantastic opportunity in this space. And finally, it's about integration of the value chain actors. And my next slide will hopefully uh, demonstrate that, that we need to go further in the integration right back to the biomass suppliers. We have it effectively on paper, but I think we need to do much more in terms of action. So deep demonstrators is what I, I would call, like some of you will know, our uh, living labs. But we need to increase the number of biorefineries in Europe. We need to ensure that they're re using renewable energy because there is an energy cost to running biorefineries. We look at the bioeconomy as producing bioenergy, but it also is cons a consumer of energy. So how do we balance that? And we must also integrate biodiversity into our thinking when we're building biorefineries, when we're building value chains. Um, and it's about training and knowledge. So what I see is that you have to have an integration of these biorefineries, not just um, a few hundred uh, people, but it's about regional development, regional plans. And that requires a, a new partnership, further partnership. That is partnership with government. That is partnership with educational authorities. That is really building a deep demonstrator that's going to have impact locally. And so that is again about knowledge sharing, and the bioeconomy needs to have open innovation. 
because that is the way in which we are going to learn and we're going to maximize our potential. And of course, all of that will help to further de-risk investment. So the integration of the investment community, banking and others into these deep demonstrators is really critical to drive that innovation. And so just a few slides to finish off, to give you a few examples. So in the blue bioeconomy, we are not harnessing the full potential of the, bio, of the blue bioeconomy. We need much more collaboration in that space because the blue bioeconomy is much more fragmented, much more small, uh, smaller operators. So there needs to be um, a rethinking of the public-private partnership to encourage uh, smaller partners to come together and to cooperate and to really achieve the potential. And the marine has a massive potential in carbon sequestration as well. How do we balance biodiversity and carbon sequestration in that? And there's value in that. That should be part of the value chains. And we, uh, Cathy Bastioli talked about soil and regenerating soil and regenerating agriculture. The bio-based industry has a massive opportunity in terms of biocontrol agents, biostimulants, biofertilizer, and also the microbiome. The microbiome is a biotech product, effectively. How do we manage it? How do we understand it so that it can maximize soil health? And we also must think about human health. Often, I've mentioned food, but many food companies will tell you that they're actually not food companies. What they are is they're nutrition companies. They want to be global leaders in nutrition, both for humans and also for animals. And in animals, of course, you have the um, use of antibiotics, for example, but you have biostimulants that can help the microbiome, you have natural antioxidants, you have bio-based immune modulators, and if you eat mushrooms, you'll know that they have immune modulators uh, present, beta-glucans. So there are many advantages uh, to natural bio-based uh, bio products. And like I've said already, the integration of biodiversity uh, and the integration of ecosystem services is really critical to the next step in the bioeconomy. How, when we're building a biorefinery, do we think about what impact does this have on biodiversity? How can it positively impact at farm level? Uh, and also, how can the ecosystem services of cleaner water, air, yeah, uh, pr um, uh, contribute to the value chain of the bioeconomy and our bio-based production systems? And we must also think about food waste. And it's not about saying, well, sure, we can waste food. We must not waste food. But where there's unavoidable food waste, what can we do with that uh, food waste? And I think that food uh, waste is one of those wastes that can actually feed into a multi-feedstock biorefinery where you have seasonal gaps, yeah? And you can actually fill the gap uh, with food waste. And finally, we should not be thinking about Europe only for the CBEJU in the next 30 years. We should be thinking globally because we have shared goals, we have shared ambitions, and we need to share knowledge. And by doing that, we can create a far more sustainable society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Kevin. And you are going to stay with us for the panel, so grab a chair wherever you like. Now, so, yep, have a seat. We're going to uh, have a question on Slido now. So if you want to grab your smartphone and go to slido.com and put in innovation after the hashtag, or simply, or, sorry, innovate after the hashtag, or scan that QR code up there, we're asking, well, we're asking you to do the panel for us, really. We're asking you what should be the priorities for the next 30 years. Uh, put in one, two, or maybe three words. We're going to generate a word cloud, but if, uh, if you can sort of summarize your thoughts in just uh, one or two, we will leave that running there on the screen in the background as I introduce my panelists. And I'll come back and have a look at what everyone's thoughts are once everyone is seated. So. Uh, let's start by introducing Fabio Fava, Vice Chair of the CBEJU and Professor at the University of Bologna. Fabio, thank you very much. Deepak Pant is Senior Scientist at Vito. Thank you very much, Deepak. We also have joining us Helena Vieira, Chair of the CBEJU Scientific Committee and Senior Coordinator and Researcher at the University of Alviero. Grit Menhout is head of the Foresters and Bioeconomy Unit at the Joint Research Centre. Stefan van Sint-Fiet is the Vici CEO since March 2023. And last but not least, Geert Messmans is VP of Research and Development at Cargill Food and Bio. So let's have a look at what's coming up, what people are talking about. It's a microbiome and open innovation, collaboration, sustainability, biodiversity, human health. 
defossilization, blue economy, food waste, fair transition. Okay, there's no way we can summarize all that. Uh, circularity coming out is very big. Obviously, the larger the word, the more people have voted for it. As we can see there, we see One Health, the blue economy, also bio-based construction, circularity coming up again and again. So I'm going to ask our panelists, just you can, we can leave that on the screen there and you can keep an eye on it during our discussion and feel free to comment on it. To kick us off, let me start. Um, we'll hear from each of you in turn to give us a, a thought on the, uh, the priorities and what they should be for the next 30 years. And again, feel free to comment on what our audience is voting for. Um, Fabio, let's start with you. Thank you very much for the introduction, the invitation. Good afternoon to all of you. Well, I'm still active in research and innovation in the bio-based area, but I'm also, since some years ago, the Italian representative for bioeconomy in different panels here at the European Commission. So my inputs will be mixed, blue sky research, but also concrete requests coming from the stakeholders engaged in the area. Well, the points are the sources of biomass, so the feedstocks, the inputs would be on the processes, but also on the products that are coming out from the sector. The resources, the feedstocks, and uh, my friend already mentioned it, the role of blue uh, economy. So the bioresources coming from the sea and the oceans are really prominent, uh, both together plus in the water are representing 70% of the surface of our planet. According to the literature, 80% of the biodiversity is there. If 50% of the primary biomass is coming from there. So we need to start looking more closely to the biological resources coming from there. For example, mangroves and salt marshes from coastal areas can be interesting feedstocks, but also green algae, sea grasses, Together, they are making 10% of the biomass coming from the sea, the oceans. They can be interesting resources from which we can do, we can prepare chemical material and so on. But more importantly, even, is the microbial systems that we have there, bacteria, but also algae, the enzymes that algae, sorry, algae, yes, but also fungi, the enzymes that they can produce. They are microbes working under difficult conditions, high osmotic pressure, high uh, uh, difficult conditions that are often those in which they have to work and transform, catalyze processes. So huge opportunities on which we need to work more closely in the future. And then more concrete, the municipal bio-waste that we are producing remarkably in our cities. We are around 140 million of tons per year in the Europe, and we are using only 40% of them for mostly producing compost, uh, biogas, and digestate. I think we need to be more ambitious here. We need to produce more chemical material from that uh, feedstock, so more ambitious multipurpose biorefineries. It also, we need to use the rest, the other 60%. They are in the cities. We need to treat and dispose because they are affecting our environment. So we need to be more ambitious here for taking advantage from this. And then CO2. CO2 is another interesting feedstock on in which we need to work more and mostly combining the potential of microbes, the biological systems, with the chemical ones. Combining, we can do more. We can take advantage from aerobic and aerobic and in microbial systems and so on and so on. Processes, my colleague again mentioned the microbiomes. We know a lot about microbiomes, it, the role that they are playing in our gut, in the gut of uh, animals, in plants, in different habitats. They can do a lot. Uh, we need to take out that knowledge, exploit that knowledge we can prepare consortia of uh, so microbiomes from, gut mi from insects, from herbicide, from natural environments, such as peatlands, for example, where we know that they are playing a key role in 
depolymerizing efficiently lignocellulosic biomass, uh, we can then exploit them for valorizing lignocellulosic biomass, produce a variety of meat chain fatty acid from which we can start to continue. And then we can more uh, efficiently exploit the innovation in the photocatalysis, electrocatalysis, they can catalyze reactions in combination with the biological processes because they are more soft. They are not asking high temperature or adverse conditions or chemicals for working. So they are more compatible with the biological methods. Products. Well, we have many needs here, but one is, in my view, very relevant, the packaging. We need to go close, quickly towards bio-based and biodegradable packaging because we are using remarkable amount of this material. Uh, we need to basically move from all plastics that we are producing from petroleum to the bio-based version. We can do more, we did. We can do more by working on other kind of plastic that we are using. We can use new building blocks, ferulic acid, vanillic acid, lignin, cutin, saberin, can be used for making new bio-based plastics. And then we need to deal with the biodegradation because we need bio-based but also biodegradable plastics. And here we need to assess more efficiently what means biodegradability, where, under which conditions uh, it is taking place. And finally, if I can, another point that was addressed by Katia Bastioli, but also by Kevin earlier. What we need to do sh for sure is to connect more efficiently the bio-based sector with the rural areas, in particular, the poorer rural area portions. Abandoned lands, marginal lands, they are producing very interesting autochthonous biomass that we can exploit in biorefineries, dedicated biorefineries. At the same time, they can also host the production of particular crops that we can use in biorefineries. The coastal areas is another portion in which we need to work more. We don't know exploit them. We have huge opportunity to exploit the biomass coming there, but also to use them for growing dedicated biomass. This means to have more opportunities for our bio-based sector, but create opportunities on the territories, regenerating them, creating jobs there. And this is very important in general, but in particular for boosting our future bio-based industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. Uh, Deepak, let's come to you. Tell us a bit about Vito and your thoughts in general as well on our topic. Thank you, thank you, Jennifer, and also to CB for the kind invitation. Very, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, a lot of topics uh, that we are also engaged in at uh, VITO are covered by the, our plenary speaker and, and Professor Fava. So VITO is a Flemish Institute for Technological Research. It's a research and technological organization. And we are not a university. We are not a company. So we are somewhere in between because the value chains were mentioned, bringing the technology from TRL 3, 4 to TRL 6, 7, so demonstrating them at scale. And several of the points that were mentioned now, especially about lignin, so that's one of the feedstocks we have been focusing for the last 10 years. Our joint center of excellence called BioRizon just uh, celebrated its 10th anniversary in Netherlands together with TNO that was established. And personally, my research has been also uh, not static. So I'm, my PhD was in biotechnology, then I moved to electrochemistry, and now I'm working more on hybrid approaches or cascade approaches, which is also what uh, Fabio mentioned. So in the first step, for example, using electrochemistry as a, as a technique to convert carbon dioxide into formic acid or methanol, and then using biological approaches to convert that into higher organic acids, fuels, and chemicals. So this is uh, the kind of stuff we are uh, doing right now. And one of the things which makes me uh, very happy reading on this uh, screen is the word defossilization. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here in this audience who, who did not write decarbonization because that will kind of defeat the purpose of all the CBE and, and this. So defossilization is indeed the right word and we have been pushing for it uh, for a very long time and now it's becoming more mainstream, so to speak. Um, another point that I wanted to highlight here is about uh, integration and value chains. And just to give, give a very short example, so between 2010 and because my research is on carbon dioxide as a feedstock and converting into fuels and chemicals, I did a, a, a bit of a reading on that uh, as well. 
So between 10 and 19, almost 150 large scale projects all over the world were started, but more than 75% of them are closed after 2019. And one of the reasons that uh, the, the, the report concluded from IEA was that because these were fragmented efforts. They were started because someone provided the money, governments, or there were political compulsions, but either they were in a resource poor region, or there was no market for the product, or technology was not mature, and so this integration of all the actors were missing. Whereas the project that started after 2019 and 2023 now, almost 90% of them are still running full steam ahead and going further. So I think the same applies for this whole bioeconomy cluster. It was also mentioned in the plenary sessions and also by other speakers. I think that's very important that the, the, the clustering is done and, and no project is left in isolation to do its own thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deepak. Um, Elena, you're wearing blue. Is that a clue to what you're going to speak about? <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you everybody. So I'm here as uh, the chair of the CBE scientific committee. So these topics are the things we discuss uh, in every meeting. So, and I'm in blue because I really like the ocean and I, uh, that's my field of expertise. It's blue uh, biotech and blue bioeconomy. Um, so if I have to say most of my research has been in, in biotech, in microbial, uh, marine microbials, and, and the usage that we can give them, so developing products from pharma to vet, but also to cosmetics or to uh, food uh, uh, and industry applications, so really harnessing the power, scaling them up, which is also challenging because many of these products come from deep, deep sea and very harsh conditioning, and doing them on a commercial viable way, it's, it's challenging. Uh, and as I, uh, I think Kevin mentioned this in, in, these, uh, in his presentation, the blue economy uh, or the blue bioeconomy actors has a particularity which represents a, a whole lot of sectors and most of the players are small uh, and, and individually uh, spaced players. So the clustering has been occurring, uh, uh, as you were mentioning, uh, in the past years and, and we are seeing, especially in the area of microalgae or seaweed, uh, or microorganisms now starting to gain traction. So this is definitely something that we should look for. But I, uh, because I'm also working in the interface between uh, natural sciences and socioeconomic sciences as a researcher now, I think one of the priorities for the next 30 years is actually to put in the same teams economists and social scientists together with biologists, physics and chemistry developing the next bio-based uh, um, solutions. And this is really important uh, to, to really be a, a point that we have been discussing a lot in the, in the CBE. So from whenever we talk about the ocean and the blue economy, and, and I'm glad that to, if we join the blue bioeconomy and the blue economy, it will be a bigger uh, word there in the cloud, it's important to understand that the ocean is quite resilient, but it's also quite fragile. And it's one ocean, it's not seven oceans. It's one ocean, everything is interconnected. So whenever, if we don't wanna do the same mistakes in the ocean that we've done in the land. We don't want to extract uh, and do a linear thinking model. So my major work in the coming years is to really look at the business models. How can we actually develop the bio uh, economy looking at new business models that incorporate the biodiversity and the ecosystem services into the monetization models of the bio e economy. So this is also something that we should uh, be thinking of. And finally, I also would like to discuss here the water challenge. Uh, the next 30 years we are gonna have, and uh, I don't remember, I think it was Kevin's last slide with the world map, and you can see there's a, a big line of uh, dry uh, planet. So the water challenge is going to be very serious and I think the bio economy can also uh, help there and the ocean has a role there not only through desalinization technologies that are evolving mm -hmm. but also looking at how microorganisms or ocean-based organisms have actually solved this problem so we don't have to invent the wheel we just have to discover and do biomimetics here so these are a few topics and finally but not uh, last but not least Look, uh, looking at the circularity also from the, and here I'm gonna speak about carbon and nitrogen cycles. The ocean is a big chunk of, of this. And again, if you link all of these to the, have a fresh look at business models, how can we create the next businesses of tomorrow 
they are really monetizing all of this. Because if we can put value in this biodiversity, in this ecosystem services, in, in restoration and in recovery, as much as we put into the extraction, then I think we can shift the path of, of bioeconomy development for sure. Well, thank you very much. Um, Great. Let's uh, hear from you um, about what's happening from the Joint Research Center side. We know, obviously, um, a really, really important um, element of, of getting information to those policymakers. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so, yeah, we have in our research center uh, also the, the CSC at ISPRA, which is the third biggest site of the European Commission. Uh, we provide, in fact, scientific evidence for, for policymakers. Uh, and we have there the Knowledge Center for Bioeconomy, which is gathering quite a lot of information, uh, data. We look at uh, biomass flows, for instance. Um, we look as well at integrated land use assessments. Um, we have, of course, as well some forest science that is backing then up uh, some uh, integrated assessments. And for us, we see the bioeconomy in a certain way as an enabler for the European Green Deal implementation. Although that the word bioeconomy is not mentioned in the European Green Deal, so for us it has been a little bit uh, difficult sometimes. Um, now, what we see, however, changing is that from going uh, from a, a pushing of the bio-based production sector, we go rather now to a pulling from the consumption uh, point of view. And I would like to mention that there we, I see three big challenges. Uh, the first thing is that we have been working a lot on the rural development, and we reached a lot in the Eastern European countries. There has been really uh, a big boosting of this uh, bio-based production. Uh, however, citizens, 80% live in urban areas. They don't live in uh, rural areas. And the citizens, they want food. They don't want food waste, they want food. And there we have a, a whole, whole link which we need to further uh, work out. An integrated view on uh, sustainable food systems is really something I think that needs to be further worked out. That is a first challenge, I believe. A second challenge that I see is that we have a huge variety of small scale products, also uh, bigger scale products, but a huge variety without that we can upscale to uh, a full blown bioeconomy yet. And there are maybe some, um, we have another market, of course, than uh, in the US. Uh, but for this upscaling, I think to have the right opportunities for a big industry, we need to think of standards. And you might think standards for a scientist, this must be boring, there is nothing new in there. But if we think of sustainability criteria, this is not so trivial always. If we think of climate targets, they do not always go in the same direction as the biodiversity target. So there, there is as well some work to be done uh, across the different uh, thematic areas. And then as third point, as last point that I want to mention here, is that of course the EU is not doing things in isolation. Um, we do want to work on sustainable carbon cycles. There has been this big communication, there has been proposals on carbon farming, and then you come with carbon credits. Now, this needs to be credible, this, and we need to work on this credibility. Otherwise, people will not invest sufficiently in this. And this requires that we have a framework for monitoring what has been done, what is the added value, and this is also not trivial. Because if we want to have carbon removal in the soil, we must be able to monitor the carbon, the soil organic carbon. And that is uh, a point that still requires quite some research, and we are happy to work with all of you on this, and if you have some information results, please uh, let us know. Uh, we can work together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stefan, uh, let's come to you and hear a bit about uh, Vivici. But I know that before this role, you also led the Dairy Cultures and Food Enzymes Business Unit at IFF. So you're bringing uh, a lot of background and experience to this. So tell us your perspective. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, indeed, if, if I were to summarize my journey up in, in one sentence, is making stuff by fermentation is what, what I'm about, right? So um, so briefly, for those of you who don't know Vivici, Vivici is a, a startup uh, based in the Netherlands. We make um, dairy proteins by fermentation. So we are in the space of alternative proteins. And 
I was quite thrilled actually to see up on the screen a couple of words in that word cloud, uh, protein diversification, sustainable food, etc. So what we hope to do at Vivici is contribute to the question of where will our food come from in the future? How do we sustainably feed a planet? Um, and as part of that, really look at the protein transition. Um, now, why is that relevant? Um, if you actually look at annual protein consumption, it's 600 million metric tons per year that we consume. Um, protein is one of the largest traded commodities on the planet. It's almost as big as oil, which is not surprising because everybody on the planet is a customer. We all need protein, right? And um, that protein demand is actually expected to double over the next uh, years driven by population growth, but also driven by uh, more affluent consumers who wish to see more protein in their diet. Now there's limitations to how much we can sustainably make with the current ways of making our protein, especially when we look at animal-derived protein, so eggs, milk, meat, right? And um, so really, whether you look at this from a pragmatic or from an ideological perspective, there is no future scenario in which we can keep making our protein the way we do it today sustainably, right? So alternative proteins are really without an alternative, no pun intended. So um, that's why there's so many companies that are actually working on um, alternative proteins and Vivici is one of them. And as I said, we, we deploy fermentation uh, to get there. Th this is for me very exciting. I've been working now 20, 25 years on fermentation technology and for the first time, um, this technology is now so mature uh, that we can start making macronutrients by fermentation, so proteins, fats, or other things, to really shift where our food comes from. Um, and so um, when I thought about this panel, and it's, it's a really lofty target, like what are the priorities for the next 30 years? It's a very expansive question, right? Um, but I tried to sort of break it down to what, what innovations do we need to sustainably feed the planet and sort of from our angle you know, um, of, of the protein transition, which is what we're trying to contribute towards. Yeah, I sort of broke it down into innovation in three areas. Um, technology, regulation, and society, right? So on the technology side, obviously, uh, we need uh, to bring down cost and we need to, to get to higher scale. That, that's trivial, right? Uh, 600 million metric tons of protein, you need a lot of um, facilities to make such protein if you were going to attempt to do that by fermentation. So scale, bring down the cost towards cost parity. Now, I, I think that is actually the easy part, right? Uh, so the second part was regulation. We really need simpler, faster regulation. There's, um, especially in, in, in Europe, um, you know, while, while as a consumer, I would never want to argue for lowering our safety standards. I think speed is, is, is of the essence. And I think we had Mark uh, Lemaire um, say something about an existential race against the clock. I believe if I captured that right, uh, but then I missed the lack of sense of urgency. Uh, so I, I'd like to see more sense of urgency also on the regulatory uh, side there. And, and finally, society. I think ultimately, when I think about a startup like ours, um, what is really limiting us in being successful in the alternative protein space? It's not really technology. It's not really um, you know fundamental economics it is whether we get the consumers on our side. So I think that is really, really important so that we sort of build great brands, we build really great consumer stories. Um, and I think I saw it actually coming up here also on, on, on the screen, really that communication, that narrative has been, narrative is a word that we heard a couple of times this afternoon. I really I think that's very, very important. What are the consumer narratives that we need to bring to the forefront to get people to buy into these type of sustainable products, because ultimately what we want is a behavioral shift, right? We can sit here and talk about technology all day long, but what we want is a, is a behavioral shift. So we need those consumer narratives. And, and in, in that context, I would say convince, not patronize, right? Really bring the consumers with you and find the, the narratives that um, accomplish that. So th those are my contributions. Thank you, Stefan. I really like how you've broken it down into those three key areas. It does help us when we're tackling something like saying, 30 years worth of R&I and how do we do it. I think that's really helpful for our discussion as well. Piotr, uh, you're, you're rounding off the narrative for the first round of introductions. So uh, from your perspective, set the scene for us. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for giving us the opportunity here. Um, I work for Cargill and we were a startup 158 years ago. 
And we, we started out and we still are a biorefinery. So we do know that logic of what you take from the farm, what you take from, from, from agriculture, or from the sea, from seaweeds, or from, from animals even. Uh, we have a responsibility to use 100% of that. And what comes with that is that you automatically end up in very different markets. We talked about food, we talk about feed, we talk about industrial in all its forms, and we also talk about fuel, we talk about energy as well, right? And the point, the reason I wanted to say that is because I wanted to um, agree with almost, every, almost everything that has been said before, but I want to call out three things that we believe that are really needed for research in the next 30 years. Because if, you, if I sit here at the end and listen to all of you talking about it, 30 years might not be enough, but uh, let's think about that. So the first one I, I would call the, um, let's call it the system and scaling uh, sequencing. Let's call the second one the acceptability acceleration. And let's call the third one the support, the solid science still. The reason I'm saying this, the first one on, on systems and scaling is if we move economies now, if we create new value chains, but also if we change the outlets and the directions in which current uh, biorefineries are going, it changes the balance. And because if you have outlets today which go to food, feed, pharma, whatever, if you change those balances tomorrow, you need to really rethink about how we do that. And from a science point of view, in our view, there is not sufficient science yet available to really look at that as an entire system, and especially not, how do you determine the right scale for each of those different outlets? The outlet that you need if you take a biorefined material which you take for uh, a personal care application may be completely different than when you're talking about lignin and, and, and construction materials. And so changing that system, how do we look at that and how do we do the scaling on that one? So, so that, that's the first big one and it talks to what many of the colleagues here have talked about in terms of which technologies, which processes are you using then. The second one on accelerating acceptability for us has a dimension of as well consumer as a dimension of regulatory. Stefan mentioned that also. We see a disconnect. We see the disconnect growing between the urgency we need and which regulatory frameworks are available. So we do believe we need research on understanding how can those regulatory systems be made robust but faster, on the one hand, but also where do we get the consumer insights? Because we talk about the narrative, but I mean, if you walk around in the exhibition area, if you read literature, if you follow Jennifer, <laughs> you find a lot of things about what's happening already. So is it the narrative or is it how that narrative ends up with consumers, right? So that's, that's the second one I would like to call out. And the third one I just wanted to mention is 30 years may be a long time, but it's absolutely the time needed for that conversion of industry and for that conversion of, of, of consumers. But we'll never get there if we don't support the basic sciences around this. The supportive sciences that we need for that bioeconomy, if you talk about how we generate energy or if you talk about how we uh, think about biodegradability or how we can, uh, certainly if you talk about marine ecosystems, there's quite a lot of work to be done there. And if we give up on investing today uh, in, in those basic sciences, we'll be cooked uh, going forward. Well, thank you. Um, just listening to you, I'm already adding to the, the questions I had since you've provoked such great um, ideas. But let's, uh, let's take as an underpinning the aim of the EU, which is to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. Um, I think we probably all agree here that that's a laudable aim. Um, and we can maybe get a sense of whether you think it's achievable or not. But taking that as, as a given, um, what do we need to do to also remain competitive? What R&I is necessary um, to maintain competitiveness whilst also achieving that uh, climate neutral goal? Um, I mean, do we risk losing out in the global competition, as it were? Kevin, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to answer that, and I'm gonna jump around, so uh, anyone who wants to jump in and react, please do so. Okay, th um, thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, so on the 2050 target, is it achievable? Um, I think yes, but 
there's a lot of things that need to happen if it's going to be achieved. Um, that is about um, changing how we think, changing systems, changing our, our approaches, the production systems, uh, our integration, our industrial outputs, but the regulation as well. Um, so it is a massive, massive, massive task, uh, but it can be achieved. And I think you need to set those targets um, in order to, to drive people to change. But again, it is the infrastructure that you put in place to allow people to actually make the change. So I think that's really important. But it also starts, um, it starts in the soil, it starts from the ground up. Uh, and so you actually have to go right back to the, before the farm gate and try to understand our production systems, our soil health, um, what crops are we growing. We know that we actually grow a very narrow range of crops. Uh, so we need to diversify there. Um, I think there's a huge amount of talk about mitigation, but there isn't actually a lot of talk about adaptation. Uh, and we have to think about that as well, that uh, if we are actually going to hit our targets by 2050, um, we, are all, we are now doing damage uh, to the climate as we speak. So the reality is we will need to understand how crops of the future are actually going to adapt to that climate. Um, so, um, and also uh, we have to face up to the fact that uh, Europe could be climate neutral, but the rest of the world may not be. Uh, and that's why I said I put up on the last slide the map. Mm. Yeah, this is not Europe's uh, task or challenge alone. Uh, and uh, also we have to recognize that everybody I hope in the room recognizes nobody has the answers on their own. So it is about collaboration, but it's about mutual respect and understanding. And I know I'm a scientist, so like microbiologists, chemists, physicists, physicists we can rank them on t in terms of arrogance. Um, uh, but you know, it depends what, what room you go into. Some scientists think they're much better than other scientists. Um, and you can spread that across, uh, across society. So I think we need to have a mutual respect and a mutual, it's the common goal and that's what I put up there. So if we want to reach this target, I don't think we'll achieve it on our own. I think we need to collaborate in order to do that. Uh, that is also, science I think is a, is a great uh, language and um, a, a discipline for breaking down uh, geopolitical barriers. Well, we mere mortals who are not scientists need this breaking down for us. Um, Helena, your, your thoughts. Is the goal achievable while maintaining competitiveness? I think it depends on how you measure it and measuring the outputs to, to, to know if you achieve the goal or not is the real challenge here. Because as Kevin said, Europe is not isolated in the planet. We might be neutral in my house, but my neighbor might be terribly... Uh, polluting, so how do you measure the outputs of Europe alone and disconsider the rest? So there's a lot of technology development that needs to be done there, ecosystem valuation. But I also think that, again, I'm going to put the tone back into the ecosystem. Europe has some of the most unique uh, ecosystems in the world. Uh, ocean speaking, we have a very large uh, ocean um, component and therefore for, for us to reach that neutrality in 2050, we need to restore our ecosystem's capability to help us achieve that neutrality. So uh, a lot of the work that needs to be done is also in repairing the damage we've made before in some of the crucial ecosystems we have in Europe. And then, of course, the collaboration uh, with... Uh, I think the missions in, in Europe are a nice example of this goal. It's, this is a common goal and we really want to create this momentum. Uh, there's, a, there's a mission ocean, there's a mission soil, and there's a reason for it. These are really important challenges that need to be tackled and create momentum all across society from bottom up. So it's the ecosystems, it's how you measure it in terms of technology that will tell you if you reach it, and it's it's by really creating these big goals like we did in the 60s for the moon challenge, so yeah. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I would just like to add one, one thing that when we ask the question whether we reach it or not, I'm a great believer in the human creativity, so in one way or another we, 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 we should be able to reach it, but I would rather reformulate as well or add something, how can we reach it? Mm -hmm. Because if it is by pushing around carbon emissions and um, externalizing our land footprint, 
then this is not the way to go. And that is where we need to make sure that we have others also on board and that we can collaborate. And their science is, is an important uh, uh, mean, let's say, to, to have this collaboration. Uh, and, and I hope, uh, yeah, that we can count on that. Well, Geert, I was going to come uh, to you as well to say how is the big important part. And since our session here is supposed to be about research and innovation, uh, tell me about how R&I works to both deliver the goals and also maintain competitiveness, because I think that's where the two intersect. The two intersect, absolutely. That's what I wanted to, to build on what, what Greg was saying there. Um, but the two intersect only if there is a regulatory framework that is fair. And I can give you an example on that. One of the things that we do today is, or we just, we just did a while ago, we, we finished in, our, in one of our facilities. We are collecting waste oil. So we do produce uh, plant-based oils, which you use at home for frying or which, which industrial fryers use. We now uh, almost rent them out. We go and get them back, the, the used oil, and we use that oil again to convert it into, into other uh, materials. Today, and so that's one example of how do you build these things and what are then the next generation of things that you can recreate from that recuperated oil and basically do what Kevin was explaining, how can you extend the life cycle of and, and make it really more circular. In current situation, for us, uh, that, that's a tough space to be because the regulations across different parts of this planet are really, really different. And so these kind of materials start flowing across the planet. And that puts quite a lot of pressure on our own plants on keeping this competitive. And one of the things that we see is that in absence of two things, again, one, consumer awareness of why am I paying, what am I paying for here, and what is my willingness to, to invest in my own sustainability, my own uh, bio-based footprint here, and two, the legal, the regulatory frameworks and the footprints, it, these things get commoditized and get the, the margin on that erodes incredibly fast. And if you live with that, then you get the question on, uh, which is in one of the other panels, is like, how are we going to invest then? Because if, if as bioeconomy, if we do all the things that we map out here, but we can't show that for investors, this is an interesting place to invest in, it won't happen. Because then the only thing we have left will be to sit and whine and hope that somebody or some government starts investing in it with, with zero expectation of return, which is probably not gonna fly for any of it. So what we need to do as R&D people is really go back and think about this, how do we make this not only circular, but how do we make sure that individual components in that system are worth it and we can find consumers that are willing to pay for it. I think you're having a really good example of where you are working in a market and a protein transition where that narrative is catching up already and where people are realizing, at least in my household, it's yeah. catching up on why that is important. So Deepak, uh, yeah, the same, the same question to you yeah. is, is and, and particularly bringing in the role of research and innovation. Yeah, so uh, uh, first of all, to answer your first question, will it be achievable? I think that's very much possible. Eh? And, and also, I have no doubt in the amount of technologies as well as the, the uh, pioneering technologies being developed in Europe by, by researchers uh, all over Europe. The point I want to add to what others have said is, and it stayed with me since the first plenary lecture that Katya mentions about incremental innovation. Eh? And how I understood it is we have a lot of technologies which are ready to scale up, sitting in the lab somewhere but they need more support to bring them to scale that they, they, you can show them that even when you scale them up, they have retained the performances, the criteria, everything, and then they are ready to go to market. It cannot be the case that every five years, six, 10 years time, the regulation changes, the goalpost shifts, and you are again looking for back to TRL zero, and every time you are looking for pioneering technologies, breakthrough technologies, while forgetting about what has been developed. And we have seen this example in, in our own case where we develop something, but it takes almost a decade from the lab to the field, depending, of course, on the technology and, 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 the, and the market. So that's what I wanted to add. 10 years is a long time when we're talking about 30-year priorities. Know. Yeah. <laughs> Fabio. Thank you. Uh, well, a couple of minor points, uh, but very close to how CBJU. Uh, of course, I, I, I'm convinced that we can achieve uh, the, the standards uh, that we planned for our carbon neutrality. 
but surely CBJU should look more closely to biofuel. We cancelled it some time ago, and, but I think it is, it's quite important to, to further work on, on biofuel. We have to work on biohydrogen. We need to better connect the multipurpose biorefinery, chemical material, and fuels. We need biofuels. 65%, 65% of the emissions are coming from the production and use of energy. A biofuel is an interesting opportunity. I think we should reconsider this position that we had in the CBJU because this is the momentum to, to do it. And of course, CO2 is the other feedstock that uh, we should work on more closely. Microbes can offer very interesting opportunity, aerobic and aerobic. We know a lot on that. Uh, we have to start exploiting more efficiently and combining with the chemical things. Thank you. And Stefan, to come to you, um, I'm interested to know if you're thinking of this from a, if you like, a product or, or deliverable to consumers and customers point of view. What does research and innovation mean to them? Um, because presumably that has to have a value in the narrative you were talking about if you want to remain or if, if businesses want to remain competitive. That's a, that's a great question, but I, I, I think and maybe we can all confirm that in a, in a sort of mind experiment, imagining ourselves in the supermarket right now. Actually, I don't think consumers care that much about yeah. research and innovation. I don't think that's driving um, buying decisions. It, I'm not going to the supermarket and saying, oh, let me today take the most innovative cookie off the shelf. You know, I mean, it's just there are other, other, other things, you know, taste and convenience and price and all of these things now. So I, I think ultimately, you know, to answer that question of is it possible, I, uh, yes, I think it's possible. I think science will save us all. That's a fundamental belief, right? And so I think it is possible to get there. However, I don't think that science on its own is enough, right? And, and again, I keep coming back to that behavioral shift. So take Europe as a, as a continent, right? Uh, there are a couple of things here that we have in Europe um, that make it possible in Europe to happen, which is we're a very affluent continent. We're very aware of um, the environmental challenges that we're facing. And as Fabio also alluded to, we have technology leadership in many areas, biocatalysis, others that you mentioned. And so if we combine all of those, we have a really fair shot at achieving this target. And, and affluence is an important part because it, once you don't, you no longer have to worry about your primary needs you can start looking towards the future and you can start looking towards how do we make that leap towards a, a, a net zero society, right? Whereas if you, if you would, were to ask that of other parts of the world today, they quite frankly have other fish to fry, right? So uh, the other day I saw a statistic that, um, and I hope I'm quoting this right, that 1% of the most affluent part of the world's population contributes to 80% of all the emissions. And, Ter thereabouts, don't. I think it was even it. higher. It was, right. <laughs> it was quite alarming. It was, it, was, yeah. it was shockingly high, right? And I was, I was flabbergasted by that statistic. But that to me translates in that we here in Europe have an obligation to work towards this, right? As, as the affluent part of the world, we have an obligation to work, work towards this. And we have, I think, a population that is, um, is, 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 is open to these type of solutions. And in many cases, like, like you said, you know, in, in, a, in your household, in our household too, you know, do, do we mind paying 5, 10, 15% more for that sustainable product? We can afford it, right? It's not such a huge uh, portion of our, of our spend, right? I mean, that's where, um, where we're not neglecting all the, all the um, you know, the problems around poverty in, in Europe, but uh, so, so not trying to be, um, uh, how should I say, uh, you know, patronizing towards the, the European population, but I think that affluence really gives us an opportunity here to, to make that uh, transition in combination with awareness, in combination with technology leadership, and just to grab onto that word competitiveness, right? Mm. That's, a, that's a really big um, topic on my mind because as, a, as somebody leading a European biotech startup in Europe, I would like to see Europe win the biotech race, right? And right now, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily look like, right? Let's be honest, right? So there's, 
really, um, you know, if you look towards the US, you look towards Asia, right, there's a much more uh, higher sense of urgency. And so I think we, we have traditionally been a continent of bio-innovation. Um, and I would like that Europe, you know, leverages that edge that we have and leverage that into the future and not give up this leading position going forward. Kevin, did you want to add something? Yeah, just um, on, the, on the competitive uh, part, and uh, you've stolen my thunder, but I, I'll repeat it. So, um, yeah, so it is the level of investment. Yeah, so if you look at Asia, if you look at the States, uh, and this is really important. So uh, it is it's important that we uh, are investing in the right things and investing at the right levels. Uh, and I think this is still not, I mean, the, the European Commission and its framework uh, program is huge, but uh, what, what are we investing in and how much are we investing? And the other thing is, that um, Brass came from Brazil and made a fantastic quote at a conference I was at recently and said for every dollar that world governments invest in bio, they invest six dollars in fossil. So what are we investing in? And that's my, that's my point. Are we investing in the right things and are we investing the right amount of money in those things? Well, we've talked um, a little bit um, about uh, technology, so I mean, I'm interested to know what you think is needed to strengthen technology transfer and collaboration between the scientific community and industry. I mean, what is the missing link there? Is, what, is it, what is the secret sauce, as they say, that perhaps they have in the US or in Asia that we're somehow not seeing here in, uh, in the EU? Helena, would you like to tackle your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, that's actually a good question because I, I just published a paper <laughs> uh, two weeks ago uh, on the trends um, now and expected for chitin and chitosan and collagen from marine origin, uh, which is just an example to study something more common. Uh, and we've actually looked at all the publications of scientists uh, from ever uh, into these topics. And it was really interesting to see that all these publications, uh, the, the trend is that they stop uh, very early in the value chain. So the goal of scientists is to publish and to, to get data out. And this is data from many, many years in three different value chains. And then when you compare to patents and, and you compare what the scientists think <laughs> are the applications of that uh, research and of that knowledge, and they name almost every possibility, and then when you look at the patent landscape, that, that part is not uh, fully published yet, but we are working on it, it's really focused on three or four areas of application, which is where the competitiveness uh, is. And the reason I'm bringing this to, to the table, and this was really interesting to see, is that also the authorship of those patents, of those publications, sorry, are Asia, Asia, and did I mention Asia? So Europe is like a tiny slice of that. So there's two lessons to learn here. One is, are we really investing in basic research like uh, uh, we said here? And I think if we look at FP7 or uh, the programs before FP7, FP6, until that FP7, we did have a lot of uh, um, investment in basic research. And all of a sudden, and, and, I, and I come from this interface, I've been an entrepreneur myself, I have my own companies, so I'm very positive about you know, m bridging the gap of investment into the later TRLs, but it feels like we now put all the eggs in the other basket, and somehow we lost the, the translation in the middle. And I think this is where we probably are lacking here in Europe, is more programs into these uh, TRLs, uh, intermediate TRLs, that force scientists to work side by side from a, an early stage with industry to co-develop and, 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 and joint venture into this uh, field. So I do believe there's a conversational space that it's not being occupied here by scientists and industry. I, and this seems like a cliche, but I really believe we need to look at data and see where can we actually put these two together. And again, uh, politics and, and, and funding, public funding can really cover this gap by designing programs that foster these type of, of uh, relations. Yeah. Uh, Deepak, uh, same question yes. to you. Yeah, I, 
I wanted to mention what uh, she, she built upon, especially about the public funding. I was looking at the numbers, actually. And it, the analysis was done uh, by, by DG Research in 2021, and a very nice report about the investment done on, on life science and bioeconomy was, uh, came out, especially for Horizon 2020 framework program. And they uh, calculated for 111 projects that are funded on top 50 priority areas. 47% of the funding actually went to TRL 1 to 5. So I thought, okay, there is actually a lot being spent. So that's close to 50% going to basic research. And if you look at the TRL, uh, beyond TRL 5, it's, it's the rest that is distributed between innovation action, flagships, and, and whatnot. So that was, that's, and, and again, when I was looking at that funding, I will come back to what I was saying before, that not to look at projects into a very uh, segregated uh, research. Eh? It has to be a value chain systems uh, thinking that, that everything is, 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 is considered before and after the project finishes and not end set publications only and that too with uh, co-authorships from, uh, from, because that's not a bad thing, eh? because collaboration is, is needed and, and not one continent or one country or one organization can do everything by themselves. So I don't see it in, as, a, as, a, as a bad thing, uh, so to speak, but then it has to bring uh, things move forwards. That's what I wanted to add. Stefan, uh, your thoughts as well on, on this and w whether we're missing something, is it a gap? between industry and innovation research? Um, and is this something you, unique to the bioeconomy or is this something we see more broadly spread across uh, development from R&I or R&D in Europe? That's a really good question. I, I don't think I have a, a satisfactory <laughs> answer because what you're essentially asking is a bit of a cultural question mm -hmm. almost, right? Uh, like why do we have such great cards to play yet fail to play them in a smart way what, what what's you know what's the magic sauce that's missing um, in sort of starting and scaling biotech companies here in Europe what one of the things that I've seen is that we um, we tend to be somewhat risk averse as, as, as people when we become entrepreneurial um, I also see that um, there is um, sort of um, a drive towards perfection, whereas in other areas maybe have, you know, tr you know, fail fast, you know, uh, sort of yeah. do and adapt, do and adapt, very iterative cycles and fail, fail fast. And also when you look at funding, so when startups actually get funding to, to scale their company, what, during that very narrow window in time when they have a technological edge, the, the funding that goes towards startups in Europe is, 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 is little. And so they are like the walking dead. It's just enough to not kill them, but it's not enough to really make them, you know, go like a rocket, right? And so that's a bit the, the European disease when it comes to the startup space, right? So uh, you see a lot of companies then finally packing up their suitcases and going elsewhere to be successful, right? So I think ultimately, if you're looking to translate all of that great science, all of that great knowledge into something that will you know, reach the consumer, which ultimately the vehicle to do so is a company, right? And, and so you have to start that somewhere. And, uh, and that's maybe where um, either culturally or from an infrastructure or funding perspective, we fall short. It's sort of the, the best way I can put it. I don't think that's a very thorough analysis, but. It's, it's a difficult question because yeah. it doesn't have an easy answer. Yeah. Um, I mean, Kiyot, do you agree with what you're hearing from Stefan? Because if you yeah. have great resources, be they human, be they uh, biological, be, th be they all the economic, um, and you're failing to sort of become a world leader, it's very frustrating. Yeah, no, I, I would fully agree. I think it has to do, uh, I would call it with, uh, we, I mean, first of all, we're very blessed in Europe. Given the environment we have, and given the number and the, the type of tools which are available to make this work, those are there. I think, I fully agree with Stefan, it has to do more with culture. And so one, I would say there is an element of realism that is missing here. Uh, Vipak, you mentioned that some of these things take 10 years. Yeah, but then you cannot have people expecting that we're gonna be billionaires in two years from now, right? So, so, so that, that realism, also that we, we have, um, I mean, and people are not more naive or different in Europe, I would say, than when I'm dealing with, with opportunities in the United States or in Singapore, but it's like, how do you progress on there? Right? So what are this, that realistic expectations of what it means, how much IP do you take, how much IP do, do, do you allow me to have, how do we move forward on that? And second point is really about impatience. 
we have a lot of, we're, we're, maybe it's cultural, and Elena can probably answer more on that. It's like, it really is like, we, we like to write three to five year research programs, and once we got the grant for that, nothing moves anymore. We move at the speed of the grant. We don't move at the speed of opportunity, right? And the same with the tools that we have in EU are fantastic, but then the speed of how we apply it, if I have to get an approval, um, I mean, maybe give you an example. Um, with, with European Specialty Food Ingredients Organization, we just looked at novel food approvals in Europe, 2018, 2022, and what happened in Europe. And what happened in US, Europe, not even half. So in the same period, we, uh, with very similar legislative regulatory tools around that, we don't move. And so, but there's no, there's not enough incentive for impatience and for making things work. And I do believe, to, to the point that Gret was making earlier, if we want those things to scale, it will have to come from collaboration between startups and bigger companies, medium-sized companies and smaller companies, three, five, nine, nine companies working together. That's the way forward. But if, the, if, we, if we don't change our mindset on how do you decide and how do you move, we're never going to get there. You may, oh, sorry. May, yeah, just I want to contribute one, one, one point, right, on, on is where um, the discussion is now sort of around Europe, US, Asia, and so on. We're sort of breaking the world into bits and pieces. Somebody said, well, we, we, it's one world, right? We're, we're one ocean, et cetera, right? I think um, one, one good way to look at this is you, you have four billion people in Asia. You've got half a billion people in, in Europe. For the fate of the planet, what those four billion people in Asia do matters much more than what we in Europe do. But at the same time, we we have, as I said earlier, we have an opportunity and an obligation to get going. And then, you know, European innovators can then have an impact beyond Europe. That's the appealing part, right? And sort of see whether we can actually develop some technology leadership, impactful technology solutions that then get a wider adoption. But I, I think. To have impact, we, we must really go global with these innovations, right? And to be fair, we have rather ignored the global south so far in this conversation. Deepak, you wanted to add something? No, just one point, because he mentioned Singapore, and it reminded me of something. I was reading some proposals about artificial meat and, and their applications, and on almost all the proposals, all the companies were going for market testing and restaurant testing in Singapore. And I was asking myself, why not here? Because the regulation, yeah. So, and then in the then discussion, they were mentioning like uh, working here with one hand tied behind the back and, and these kind of things. So that also plays an important role. And so the uh, regulation has to be an enabler. And I could not, uh, I could totally relate with the point that Katya was mentioning earlier, the sense of urgency that Stefan was saying. So that, that should be there. Okay, now we're going to have, of course, another round of further discussion here, but I want to see if there's any questions in the room at this stage for our panelists. Um, we have microphones roving around so if anyone wants to put anything to the panelists now that they want to build on from this thread of conversation. Anyone, any hands up? Yes, I see one just here in the aisle. And we're going to get a microphone to you. So fourth row back on the aisle. Thank you, I'm David Newman. I'm the chair of the European Bioeconomy Bureau Hi to Kevin and to, to Fabio, old friends. Um, one thing you haven't talked about is market pool. If you look at all the innovation which has actually come to market, renewable energy, or, uh, battery, electric vehicles, etc., over the last 20 years, it's all because we've laid down targets and we've laid down obligations. We don't even have a target here for these materials beyond they can be used for sticky labels on fruit and vegetables, for God's sakes. And yet, the European Commission is investing three billion euro in researching into those same materials. Wouldn't market pool targets and market pool obligations solve a hell of a lot of your problems, for example, in terms of your startup business, giving you markets that are determined by legislation? No one spoke about this. Anyone want to try and tackle that question? Stefan? You wouldn't rely on market pool as the, as was suggested. Oh, great. No, no. <laughs> we can take it in turns. Great, go ahead. Uh, happy to mention only that we believe in diversity as well. Uh, so um, 
that's a little bit in Europe you have uh, to, to, to balance and that has of course always the problem that you don't invest the billions and billions that you need to have a big shoot, but that can of course fail, so we don't do that. We, we have much more diversity, this is our social system, this is our, we are not a technocratic system that decides on one, one thing, and so you leave space for everything. But leaving space for everything means that you can not push all the things as much as in the States or in, in, in China. Now the point on uh, where Europe is, uh, or the European Commission is looking more strongly is on strategic autonomy. That is a very important point um, for which we would like to see uh, when it comes to, uh, the, well, circularity is there. One of the big issues that we, we think is, is very important where we can still take maybe a leading role um, and that we team up all together so that uh, we are stronger together than that if every country goes and, and looks for its own resources. So if there is more a European way of thinking about that, then we are bigger and, and can have a more strategic, autom stronger autonomy. But that's just a small point. Yeah, I thought it was actually a really interesting question. So market market pool, so if we look, for example, at the success of the electric car in, in the Netherlands, right, is that because um, there were so many tax breaks, we are famously stingy after all, or um, because, uh, you know, consumers uh, were really buying into the, the, the story there, right? I mean, it's my belief that um, if you provide consumers with an alternative that is more sustainable and requires little sacrifice, so slightly more expensive, little less convenient and so on, you have enough market pool. Like everybody understands that if they can make a choice that's more sustainable at little cost to themselves, they're more likely than not they're willing to make it, right? So that to me constitutes market pool uh, because to a certain extent the European consumer is a post-materialistic consumer, they, when they make a purchasing decision, they care about what that purchasing decision says about them, so how it reflects on them, right? So they, they're willing to make the sustainable choice, but it has to be at little sacrifice, right? That's where there's a sliding scale. Some very ideological consumers, they're willing to sacrifice a lot. They don't care if it's five times more expensive, they don't care if it's three times more crappy, they'll buy the sustainable product, right? but that's a minority. And so what we need to get to, and that's why, why I said earlier, science will save the world, is through innovation we will get to, uh, to alternatives that are sustainable and, and, uh, and, and require little sacrifice to make the sustainable choice, right? And so I, I think f to a certain extent, does regulation create um, a, um, an impulse for that? Right, so you, you, can, you can create a level playing field or you can have regulation or, or tax breaks, what have you, create that push, but ultimately, I think that market pool intrinsically exists. Again, going back to the affluent continent of Europe, I think that pool exists in, in, in Europe. Yeah, that is the main Helena, you want to add yeah, something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add something on the food uh, system uh, part, because there's also this risk and uh, I, uh, in the ocean, again, in the blue economy, this is very relevant for aquaculture uh, products or for uh, ocean-derived food, is that we don't also want to be uh, so strict in Europe production that we end up uh, prohibiting almost production of food in Europe due to all the regulations we have in place, but then we don't put any barrier to the food coming from the outside, God knows how it is produced, and I'm talking about aquaculture uh, in many countries, that, that flood the European market with very competitive pricing. And again, at this point, the consumer is not yet ready to pay the premium price for the uh, European produced food. So there's got to be a balance also here. And this is where I think the market pool could actually work, which is if the European Commission could give a, a clear sign that the consumer should consume European made, but that sign needs to be at price level because that's what moves consumers. It, it's either because this, the, the, the commission takes part of the risk for the companies to cover the price cost of the production that it's demanded here, or because you've forbidden somehow 
the import, import of, of this type of food. So, and there's the bioeconomy has space here as well to develop because there's a lot of solutions to make our own production, uh, food production systems better. Not only, you know, biofertilizers, but also technology-wise for species, you know, new foods approval is really a problem here in Europe. So I don't want to talk about the problems, but I also believe that Europe needs to be very careful in this regulatory framework and how we, we, we look at what's uh, built outside. And in the strategic uh, autonomy, and uh, Europe being very open and, and considerative of all the options and, and providing and dividing, you know, the egg basket among everybody. I think there's, uh, this is true for the horizon or uh, programs, but for example, you look at the EIC, the European Innovation Council and the funding they are giving for the scale ups and the startups, and they have clear challenges and they have clear bets that they do every year. So they're not putting all the eggs in, in all the companies. They are really looking at strategic um, sectors and giving a lot of money for states uh, level, so 30 million or more to European scale ups in these strategic uh, areas. Agriculture is one of them, renewable energies, uh, supercomputing is another one, for example, just to give you uh, two examples. Yeah. And of course, other instruments are available. It's not just EIC, there's things like EIT, food and so on. They're all doing supportive acts. Kevin, uh, you wanted to jump in on this point. Sure, yeah. Uh, sure, thanks very much. So I do think targets are very important. I think we should be setting targets. Um, and they're not the only solution, but I think they help to stimulate the market. They help to um, de-risk investment, uh, which is really, really important. Um, and, but I also think market incentives are really important. I, I said earlier, maybe it was a bit, it um, uh, wasn't uh, direct enough, but what are we investing in? Yeah, so very much part of, okay, where are the incentives uh, to actually drive uh, market uptake? Uh, and I do think targets uh, are very important, but I think that Europe prefers targets for reduction than targets for production. So if you look at plastics, for example, uh, how are we going to get rid of single-use plastics? A very good idea. But there is a fear, for me, there's a fear amongst policymakers uh, about change uh, in Europe. And so that fear, then you can argue, maybe, and it's a bit unfair, but it's paralysis by analysis. Yeah, and so then, uh, well, if I go this way, ooh, that'll happen. If I go that way, ooh, ooh, that'll happen. And I find that if you go to the States or if you go to Asia, they're much more about learning by doing. And you can argue that there are flaws in that approach because then you make a lot of mistakes. But maybe you, you do need to make mistakes uh, in, order to, in order to learn. We are all, like Oscar Wilde said, people say that they learn from their experiences. They don't, they learn from their mistakes. So I think there is a bit of paralysis by analysis. And so, but there's also, I feel, uh, there are, and I talked about this earlier, there's still too many market incentives for the wrong products. So you need to change, you need to change that. We need to change the narrative. And, you know, there are certain parts of the European Commission that will back recycling of fossil-based plastics over bioplastics because we have a full understanding of the life cycle of these fossil-based plastics and what recycling can do. And we don't have all the answers for what bio-based. But surely we understand that we cannot, we cannot remain with fossils. So I think there is, there is a bit of lag behind, uh, policy is lagging behind uh, market innovation. That's a bit complex now, but yeah. Uh, Fabio. Yeah, well, simply, I fully agree. And simply, we, we, we had the privilege to listen to Katia Bastioli in her talk, and then at the end, she went to the points. So that is the points, the one that were mentioned. And there is this not consistency in, in, in within the commission, no? different directorates. Uh, we invested a lot in the innovation that we are talking here, billion, yeah, it's a long story. Fantastic things, uh, but we have problems in having legislation recognizing these products as it was mentioned. So that is, I think, in the core problem. And the other one is that we need to have more partnerships, public, private, because this is crucial for then transferring. And then the link with the local territories. We should not forget the opportunity coming from more synergies in between what we are launching here, what we are developing, and what 
should be implemented in the territories. Synergies also among uh, funds, that the, the structure of funds that can be aligned, etc. This can help, of course, the, the, the transition, the setup of the, the industries. But again, but the main point is the regulations, in my view, are very clear the point. Thank Great. you. you wanted to yeah, I, I wanted, however, to, to come back as well. I, I agree that there are definitely uh, failures made. I think that is not uh, what I want to contest, but I think there are as well some great progress. Uh, there's great progress made. So we have recently uh, the EU deforestation-free regulation where we ask consumers to pay for a, a higher price in a certain way for biocommodities that should come from areas that are then not anymore deforested. Um, for instance, thinking of cocoa and chocolate, uh, in Europe it is from the, first of, uh, from the 30th of uh, December next year, we can be sure that the chocolate that we are eating is not anymore made with cocoa that comes from a, a forest that has been uh, degraded with cocoa plants. And that is thanks to this regulation. So some thinking uh, on how to uh, start bringing our value in this, uh, in this trade is, is, is uh, happening. And I think it's a, a nice step forward. We would need to do on more, but it is not evident. So on chocolate, which is a, a luxury product, you can do. If it is on the standard products uh, of wheat, this is already much more delicate. Uh, so we want to go for a fair transition. This is not uh, so evident. Uh, but I, I agree with, uh, and also on the, the fossil subsidies, we definitely want to have them disappearing. This is the member states as well that need to stay behind that. This is not only that we dictate this, no? This is, uh, I think there is a general agreement, but the implementation is then some, something else. It is the law to say in Brussels that not everything is EU competency. Sometimes it's member state competencies. Uh, you have to say that at any panel in Brussels. Um, Geert, uh, you had a comment you wanted to add? Uh, sure, wanted to, to add as well that, uh, building on what Stefan was saying there, it's like if you, experience we have is that if you replace a product simply by a bio product, it only works if it's <coughs> as qualitative and preferentially cheaper then it works. The, the room for creating new standards and creating, but then also a lot of customers totally don't care. They don't want to see it. They, it's, it's other people in the chain that are interesting to say. And so the market pull, if you like, is coming from uh, the ingredients uh, buyers of big companies who are making those kind of company. The opportunity to create market pull is if you can show where that differentiation and that value addition is. And if you can't show that, you'll never get to market pool. What I'm, the reason I'm very optimistic about this is that I think one of the things that you see now, thanks to a lot of the tools that EU is, is putting in place, you, we do see more startups happening in Europe. And a lot of these people are starting on the right angle. They're starting with consumers and they're putting things on the market which are truly different from what, quote, unquote, the, uh, the bigger companies traditionally have been doing. And in that way, they're pushing us and they're, they're helping us all as consumers as well, at least me as a consumer, to look at other things that we're doing. And so it, it's this dilemma, I think, where we are in, in this transition point. I, I think that's what, what, what Geert was referring to as well. It's like you have these opportunities and you have this market pull very locally and by very small companies. But in order to have the impact that we need to get to 2050 and beyond, we need to find ways of scaling that. And very often, then the market pull comment seems to be going away. I don't have a clear answer on it, but I, I am very hopeful that we have these startups and people who are trying to do things differently that will help us with pulling that market. Yeah, just a quick point, I suppose that, yeah, I suppose we're talking in the negative about uh, regulation, et cetera, but you also have to say that the BBIJU and the CBE now has been a huge success, and that has been as a result of policymakers in the EU taking big risks. Uh, and when uh, Biobase Industries first approached people like John Bell, uh, nobody knew about the bioeconomy, it was incredibly risky. And if we look now at the number of biorefineries that are in Europe, and we should expect failures of biorefineries because this is the normal growth cycle, yeah? Uh, we shouldn't be afraid of failure even though as Europeans we are paralyzed by it. Um, but uh, 
it is really important to recognise that uh, the, the investment in innovation, the investment in looking at the market and looking at the potential of Biobase has been very much, like there's been great foresight. Yeah, so we, I, I want to say that because I know there's a bit of negativity in the panel, but I think it's very important to recognise that, okay, there are many problems, but there are also people sticking their neck out to try and create this sector yeah, in Europe. I'm, I'm going to put my devil's advocate hat here for, for a minute and feel free to disagree with me. Um, there's a, a couple of things I'm hearing. There seems to be quite a, a, an, an affinity, if you like, for the fail fast, fail better um, approach that we maybe see in particularly in the US. Um, but obviously, the bioeconomy is important. We're talking in some cases, we're talking about foodstuffs here, and no one wants to be a guinea pig. So I mean, that's my pushback against that. The other thing is there seems to be a generalized assumption that investment in R&I or more innovation automatically de facto leads to a more expensive product at price point for consumers. And that isn't necessarily the case. Surely innovation can lead to not just better, but also cheaper products uh, to consumers. So I'm pushing back on both those. Um, and I'm going to see if there's any comments or questions from the room. Uh, anybody else like to ask our panel anything? We are getting to, okay, good. So we have third row, so let's go left, left to right. So right down here on the second row on the end, and then third row in the middle, and we'll work our microphone all the way back. Uh, my name is uh, Nelo Emerencia. I work for the Biobased Industries Consortium. And when I listen to your question whether climate neutral Europe is feasible by 2030, uh, unanimously everybody says yes. But the angle so far has been by science. And the statement was even made, science will save the world. I believe that we miss one huge dimension, and it is it's not gonna happen if the people are not along, if the behavior is not along. And I believe Stefan is the one that came close to what I feel now is we can, you know, R and I is out there to, to facilitate, to make things happen, to, to build biorefineries. If we can we can design and, and, and build the most fantastic biorefinery, we can make the more beautiful product, whatever, but if John and Mary and all of us here don't buy it, don't use it and consume it, if we don't change our behavior, it's not gonna happen. So I believe that, or this is a suggestion, maybe we should start speaking not only about R and I, but about R and I and E, and the E standing for education, because I believe this is the best way to get this behavioral change, and that is to start with education from the primary school, and then go through all the system and not only those that go through schools, education, but general, again, John and Mary in all societies. So education and getting into this behavioral change is what I believe is key. Thank you. I don't think you're going to hear any disagreements. It might be about where does that responsibility for that sort of education lie. Uh, Deepak, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, this is something we've been missing in, in the discussion so far. And what he's mentioning is about the willingness to pay, as the European Commission parlance, they say. You make a product, if, unless there is no willingness to pay, you can't shove it to the consumer, and that's, that's one point. Another point for missing RNI link for the coming years in the, in the board or something is, is about the social science. Eh? So how to alter the consumer behavior, I think that should be also brought into picture. That's, uh, now we are only talking of the lab-based research eh? doing in, in, in our, our, our shelves, but this is more uh, to, to directly reaching the consumer and trying to understand the needs in the first place and then how to influence them in the long term. That's Thank you, another question. Yeah. Well, my name is Hans Keuken, a Process Design Center. So yeah, we also do quite a lot of uh, biorefineries. Well, what is bothering me? Uh, um, well, Europe is very good in uh, regulations. Uh, they often we try to over-regulate things and it is yeah, stopping us from doing things, yeah, which is not nice. But one of the things is, of course, the LCAs we also have, have to do. And when I look at the LCAs, when I look for, uh, for instance, well, the lady in the middle tapped on water, for instance, eh? yeah, you mentioned water. Well, water-wise, we are not doing that good compared to the fossil industry. Yeah? So our water footprint is uh, not that nice. Well, energy-wise, we also need energy yeah, to run our biorefineries. Well, when I look at LCA, then it's very difficult with a bioplastic, for instance, to beat recycling of fossil plastics. You're normally gonna lose. So the industry we are in is not that easy. And what makes it even more difficult, I see, for instance, well, 
Uh, my company set up 50 benchmarks that is used for CO2 emission allocation in Europe. I've seen fossil plastics dropping factor two in carbon footprint in 10 years. So when our challenges yeah, in the back are manipulated by existing industry, it becomes very tough. And then you, you get Europe with their regulations. So you, can, you are up to big dinosaurs here, you know? They play also a game. So you have to be careful because otherwise you're gonna lose. So I, I think also about open LCA or wiki LCA, I also call it. I, I'm not, I don't like to do LCAs, you know, I'm not an LCA fan. But okay, well, let's see if any other our panel is an LCA fan. <laughs> Want to tackle? Yep, Stefan. Yeah, I'm an LCA fan, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, no, I mean, the reason why is, is because I think that, um, you know, we need to get quantitative about these things. It's not good enough to do something that we think is sustainable. We actually have to get down and do the math to show that it's sustainable because otherwise we're wasting our time. It's as simple as that. Do we all need to do an LCA about everything? No, but we need to get quantitative about it because that's the only way to know what is the difference between something that's truly impactful and something that's greenwashing or fooling ourselves. Mm -hmm. And fooling ourselves is not going to solve the problem. I mean, it's about having the correct form of assessment for your, what yeah. you're doing. Any, we, I saw some other hands that went up here. Okay, so there's one here a little bit further to the front and then two at the back, I think. And on this side, do we see any hands up over to this side of the room? No. Yes. Hi, I'm Sylvia Hildeman from Ghent University. Um, interesting discussion. I heard a lot about um, regulations and, and markets actually in, an, in a session about RNI and, and I was missing a bit um, maybe the, the perspective that RNI and, and innovation is not a linear process um, you need to it's, it's quite often cyclic and and we have a lot of, uh, of these new biorefineries that are that are being developed but um, basic research can actually um, help solve some of the challenges that you are facing while you are you know, putting these um, technologies onto the market. And, and I think that's just an important thing that I, that I want to stress. There are new developments, uh, whether it's synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, all these things um, that can help you solve the, the challenges. And um, I think we must not forget to fund these type of things as well. Um, and yeah, not see uh, research and innovation as a linear process, but really as something cir uh, circular as well. Thank you, I think Helena agrees with you. Yes, uh, thank you for the comment, very pertinent. And uh, um, I did mention in my uh, top uh, priorities that basic research should be focused and refocused again. And actually it's very interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm not allowed to mention all the comments we do in the scientific committee of the CBE, but one of the biggest discussions we had lately was about how do we incorporate basic research into the flagship projects and, and not just fund, you know, final market operations, but actually allow for those projects to have basic research plugged in into the project because exactly we have the same feeling uh, at uh, CBE. So I think CBE is doing things in the good way uh, by not forgetting, and there's also RIAs being funded in, in, in CBE. So definitely yes, but in Europe as a whole, uh, that was also my comment that we should not forget how strong we have always been in basic research and how the latest technologies uh, and development can actually help market deployment of all of these uh, bio-based, so yeah. Deepak, you want to do? I, I agree with the, uh, with the colleague here, and also uh, in, the, in the new programs that you see, not only from CB, but from others, the new technologies like AI, machine learning, they want to bring that into the basic research and how it can accelerate the, the, the basic research yeah, so that it don't take too long uh, stay in the lab, but accelerate it by, by these new tools that, are, uh, that have come out in recent years. Okay, uh, more, if everyone can put their hand up, we'll try and get to as many as possible because we don't have a huge amount of time left. So we'll have one, two, three, and three. Okay, perfect. We'll have the, the, the gloved hand at the back, please. Uh, okay, <coughs> my name is uh, Gerling Karina Christiansen. I come from North Sweden European office. We represent Northern Sweden and I'm the bioeconomy policy advisor. And uh, I completely agree with about the deforestation regulation in regards of 
chocolate and uh, coffee and uh, all those commodities, but it also regulates any kind of forestry biomass, even though forestry uh, is not a global driver of deforestation, not in Europe, not nowhere. So, uh, and there's going to be huge, uh, our, our analysis says this defore deforestation regulation is just going to throw gravel into the entire development of the bioeconomy uh, that are dependent on forestry uh, biomass. Uh, one real big problem is the developed products uh, that uh, are mixed like paper and maybe, maybe fuels, uh, uh, and uh, wood pellets and wood energy and all of that, they, like the trees can be harvested on 1,000 different sites and different situations. And the regulation from January uh, 2025 requires geolocalization for every piece of sawdust that is, uh, uh, every piece of sawdust, it's going to need to have uh, where was the tree harvested and when was, it, was this tree harvested. So that's going to put a huge uh, amount of bureaucracy and liability on the entire development of the bioeconomy uh, that we all want to see happen. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to take the last three questions together just for expediency. So we have one here at the front and then we have the lady at the back. Thank you, panel, for this interesting discussion. My name is Astrid Hannes. I work for the European Region Research and Innovation Network. We represent more than 124 regions all over Europe. And that is maybe also the word that I would like to add, adding on, on education mentioned here, on fundamental research mentioned there. Uh, the, the, the public authorities, they popped up in the discussion, often uh, relating to regulations and how it is difficult. But I would also launch a positive call on that note because I really think that public authorities are partners in this joint mission. So if you get them on board, also from the industry side and from the research side, and really do this ecosystem approach also in working together, I think it's really a very important step to get them involved from the beginning so they can actually support to put the best possible conditions in place to deploy solutions afterwards. And also think of it in a, in a uh, cost-efficient way, not to endlessly duplicate things that already have been done elsewhere, but see how cooperation can actually support scalability, transferability, and really uptake by, yeah, in the end, citizens at local level. So that was my addition. Thank you, a good addition. And uh, our last question or comment here. Yeah, hi, Acacia Smith from the Good Food Institute. Uh, we're working to advance alternative proteins. Really happy to see that food is part of the discussion today. Um, I think generally food and particularly alternative proteins tends to be very underfunded. Uh, there was a report from DGRTD um, earlier this year which showed that under Horizon 2020, only 1% of funding went to alternative proteins. So it's clearly not enough. Um, and yeah, strongly believe that research and innovation into to taste and price is a really key driver here and it should preferably be public funding so um, the whole sector can grow. I think one of the issues we see is that product um, development, so the RNI that's addressing the taste, the price, and bioeconomy are being dealt with as two different subjects and there is this lack of um, circularity in, in that funding which feels like a big barrier. Um, and yeah, just to mention as well, I mean, the UK, I can't remember if it was today or yesterday, but they published this new, um, their own initiative on biomanufacturing with two billion in funding, uh, including uh, cultivated meat in scope. Um, and so it, it's a big question to end the session with, but how do we create more synergies between the bioeconomy and food and really bring food more strongly into the discussion when we know that we, we need to reduce agricultural emissions if we're going to meet the Paris uh, goals. Well, thank you all, all three there for your comments. Uh, Kevin, you want to react straight away? Sure, yeah. Uh, just on the first uh, comment, I absolutely agree, and that's why I put it up on the slide about deep demonstrators and bringing in, and when I said government, I mean local government, regional government, really, really important. 
And I, I have actually an example in Ireland where we work with uh, Tipperary County Council, which is the, lo uh, the local government, the regional government, and their um, investment of their time and energy with us along the road, and that's been for six or seven years, has made it so much easier to deal with things like planning, deal with things like you know building a biorefinery, all of these things they, they understand and then they start to bring in other partners and say, these guys are doing this, how can they work with you in synergy? So I absolutely agree. But I think that's what the BBI is trying to do as well, and the CBE is trying to build those partnerships. And I think for the next phase, it's really about further integrating and further developing and making them critical central par partners. Uh, on the food bit, um, I did again open with saying that food is very much part of the uh, bioeconomy and it's a critical, in Ireland we say food first in the bioeconomy, the first product that comes out of the bioeconomy is food and then other products um, arise. So, um, and maybe it's my perception, but I actually think there, it is changing, the amount of investment that is going into alternatives is increasing. Um, because people realize, okay, we can solve some problems with the current agricultural system, but we know that ultimately we need alternatives as well. I don't know if that's fudging it or not. But. Well, I've just had a look again at that, uh, that word cloud that we generated, and I do see on there, I see nutrition, food waste, veganism, and sustainable food all in there as categories. So there is some support in the room, obviously, for, for that. Anybody else like to comment on any of the other points raised before we go to a final? Yes, Fabio. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the lady here in front, uh, coming from, if I understood, commission dealing with uh, the, the regions. That is exactly what we need, and we need to reinforce that kind of action, uh, crucial, co-designing since the beginning. That is very important. So, personally, I think is uh, one of the major solutions that we may have about the food. Food is in the bioeconomies, the, the, the most important pillar of our European bioeconomy. And as Kevin mentioned, it, uh, any nation, any country with a national bioeconomy strategy is bringing together food, the connecting food. CBJU didn't push, well, BBIJU didn't cover so much in the past, but now we are improving. We are improving, we are doing more, and it is a key word that we plan, that we are discussing also in the, in the state representative group that I'm, that I'm joining. So it, it is coming. And then education, Nello, crucial point. <laughs> As a professor, I can say crucial, but it's not longer and not enough, the education at the university level. We need to go deeply and actively at the primary school, secondary school. They are very close to, to the bioeconomy. If we are growing them properly, they will be the new citizens, but they align the mother, the father immediately in the evening after the experience. They are the only one that are aligning us, right? Our kids in doing, changing things. So yes, I fully agree on that. Uh, great. Yeah. yeah, maybe one small comment on the deforestation free uh, trade regulation uh, on the, the forest and the wood. Indeed, wood is one of the most difficult uh, biocommodities uh, when it comes to the monitoring of that. But we believe that forests definitely are degrading. The resilience, uh, their climate resilience is going down. Um, and it will be more difficult for the forests outside Europe than inside Europe. When it comes to paper industry, we have seen examples li uh, like in Finland, how paper industry economy was taken over by uh, the biotextiles industry. So there are possibilities as well. So I would not see it as a, uh, yeah, um, in a hindering of the, the forestry uh, as a whole. Thank you. Well, thank you all very, okay, one Wait, last phase, one last we've, one, we've gone over time. I, I just <laughs> wanted to add one last thing, which is about, Underneath all of the questions that we talk about here, I think we should absolutely not forget that it, it starts at a farm. It starts with an individual farmer who makes the individual choice or what he or she is willing to put on their fields and what they're going to harvest. And, the and so, and the well, they're, they're farmers. <laughs> farmers, uh, seaweed growers, algae growers, <laughs> they're all farming, okay? <laughs> Agree on that here? But if we don't convince those people, and if we lose those, and if we don't set it up as a system where it, it, it is viable for these people, then everything we're talking about is gonna go nowhere. Eh? 
because these people make this choice once a year, so it's not between now and 2030, it's seven more decision points on am I going to put more protein-based material or more thing? And if we li lose that, none of what we're talking about is worth talking about. Okay, well, I'm going to put a final question. You've only got one of three options because this is a 10-second answer only from everyone. Um, are the strategic research and innovation agenda objectives still relevant? A little, a lot, or not at all? Kevin? A lot. Fabio? A lot. Deepak? More than ever. <laughs> we, we Elena? Should. Always. Always, indeed. Yes, Stefan? Would agree. And you're not going to dissent now. Okay, great. All right, thank you all very much. That was very quick and easy. Um, thank you so much for the great questions. Thank you, and please give a warm round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. I hope I will see many of you in this innovation stream again tomorrow. There is an exhibition, there's networking, and remember to hold on to your badges.